Yeah. Welcome to uh, Norwegian Unix User Group's uh, monthly uh, meeting. And uh, uh, just want to uh, say thank you all for showing up, uh, even if in this uh, uh, really hot day. Uh, after the meeting, we'll head over somewhere to uh, have a drink and maybe uh, some snacks. So uh, please uh, join us there. I'll uh, pass along a list so we can count the number of people attending, so please put your name in there. Uh, when all those practicalities are out of the way, I would like to uh, welcome uh, today's speaker. It's uh, not uh, the same president as I've been uh, covering all the uh, news uh, front pages today, but it's a different president, a better president, I think. And it's the president of the VLC Foundation that is one of the lead developers of uh, the uh, most used video player in the world. And I'm looking forward to hear what he has to say about all the new features of uh, the latest version. Here you are. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, so I'm going to do a small presentation that is going to tell about uh, VLC, the history, what we've been doing lately, but also what we are working on for the rest. Uh, so my name is Jean-Baptiste Kempf, I'm French, sorry, no one is perfect. Uh, I'm 35 years old and a geek, and I've been working on VLC since too long to count. Um, that's probably more than 10 years. Um, and I'm also the president of the Video Non-Profit Organization, which is a French organization whose goal is to have cones everywhere in the world. Um, but besides that, also to do everything related to open source uh, video software. Um, the story of Videoland is a weird story. Um, it, it's a story uh, that started at the Ecole Centrale Paris, which is a university 20 kilometers south of Paris. Um, and it's quite weird because um, for lots of reasons, it's a public university uh, engineering school, but it's on a campus that you can see here that is uh, uh, owned by a private uh, group, which is basically the alumni. Uh, but that, what, that, what that meant is that everything was managed by the student on the campus. Everything, including the network. Um, so IBM put some wires there in 1980s, and it was token ring. I don't know if any of you know what token ring is. Yes, OK, you're very good geeks. That's nice. Um, so token ring is great uh, in the in 80s. It has a small problem is that every time you add a new computer, you increase the loop, um, and everyone reads, and you increase the latency. Well, it doesn't matter when you're trolling on an NTP or uh, over Gopher, but when you want to play video games, it's bad, because if you have high latency when you play, uh, shoot them up, you die. Um, so the students went and say, went to the university and say, hey, please, can we have a new network? This one is too slow, blah, 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 token ring. It was 1993. And of course, the university said, ah, we would love to help you, but you know, we cannot, because the campus is not ours. Of course, they knew that the students wanted to play video games, because there was nothing on the internet interesting that required better than 10 megabits per second. Um, so the students decide that, well, you know, we're going to find someone to give us a new network. And, and, they, go, and they go to the people who actually build the, 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 the campus, which was Bouygues Telecom, Bouygues, uh, Bouygues Company, which is like a huge uh, company in France that has everything from, from cars to buildings to internet uh, company and so on. And they say, well, you know, we don't understand anything of what you're talking about, but you should talk to our satellite uh, guys, who are TPS at those times, because we believe that the future of television is satellite. Well, well no, <laughs> but 20 years ago, it, it sounded cool. Um, so the idea was to take only one dish of satellite, because every dish costed a lot of money, but mostly the decoders, because you know, it required a full MPEG-2 live decoder that costed around uh, 5,000 francs at that time, and that was way too much, right? And you couldn't do that for 2,000 students on the campus. Uh, so only have one decoder and then restream that on a network. And then people with computers could decode that. Of course, we are talking on 1995, so having a, a, a software MPEG-2 audio and MPEG-2 decoders on your 486DX or your Pentium 60 was completely science fiction, but the students say, okay, let's try and do that. And that's how they started the project, which was called Network 2000. Um, and it was just streaming the DVB satellite to the network and have players. Um, it worked fine, more or less. 1997 worked. Uh, it worked for 45 seconds after everything was crashing. 
uh, because of course there was memory leaks everywhere, but it was fine, right? The demo was 35 seconds, so you crashed before, and the ma ma machine was huge with 64 megabytes of memory, or something like that, right? So um, it was a success, uh, but they decided to um, show that they wanted to move it to open source and, and start again and say, well, maybe there are other people who care about a solution like that. So we need to find a solution that can, is going to be able to do video streaming on a LAN, which became Video LAN. Um, so that's 1998. Um, and there were lots of software there. One of them became, was well, the client side, which grew and grew and grew and became Video LAN client and then VLC. Um, and it took them three years to move it to GPL because the university wanted to keep it as proprietary because you know they could make money out of that. I have no idea why. Um, and start, and that's how it moved to open source in 2001. And from there, stuff went great. Um, VLC. A lot of people don't know VLC. A lot of people, when I say, well, you know, I work on VLC, say, no, no, I don't, don't see. Yeah, yeah, the, the cone you have on your computer that plays video. Oh, yeah, 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 I use that everywhere, every day. For, to play everything, it's great. Um, so the, the, the cone, the symbol of the cone is completely insane and stupid for any software because, like, what? What? Like, they have absolutely no, no meaning with video, right? It's not a play, it's not a button, it's not a film, it's nothing, right? It's just a cone. But it's so uh, distinctive because no one in the same mind would use that as a software for video that everyone knows the, the cone. And it's an amazing trademark. Uh, one of the reasons it became popular is that because it was open source, people kept adding features, right? And at that time, you're probably uh, too old uh, to remember that, but when you were, and of course none of you were doing that, uh, there was like lots of codec, and you tried that with Windows Media Player, and it didn't work, and say, well, I don't have this codec, right? So you had to go and download codec packs for Windows, and those codec packs were a piece of crap with lots of malware in it, but that's fine, <laughs> and it still didn't work. So you installed a new codec pack, and the new codec pack was fighting the previous codec pack. So like, and now no video was playing at all. So VLC, and because it was done in, on Linux, um, by guys on Linux, they basically took all their Linux library with them. And so when you download and use VLC, it comes with all their codecs. And you don't have to have codec packs because it doesn't integrate, integrate with the Windows or the Mac OS system. And that became very popular because then people, VLC has this legend that it can play anything. Actually, it cannot, uh, but for most of the people, it was great. And the second thing that made VLC popular was that VLC was a client for server streaming solution, right? Which means that when you're on network, you don't expect the file to be complete. You try to play it as much as you can. Um, and in those times, and of course, none of you would do that, but some people downloaded stuff on eDonkey, uh, Emule, Kaza, uh, or other peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks, and, and that was very problematic because it took 24 hours to download on your 56 uh, kilobits um, uh, connection a, 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 a two hours video that was 700 megabytes, and after the end, after 24 hours, you realize that the, the movie which you were trying to watch, which was the latest James Bond, was in fact a Disney movie, and you were completely not happy, or the other way around. You wanted a Disney movie for your kids, and you got a, 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 a soccer match, right? Um, so the thing is, lots of multimedia formats have their metadata in the end, so you had to wait for the end. Well, VLC said, well, I'm going to try to play. Uh, I don't find the metadata. Well, probably the network is broken. Let's try anyway. And after one hour, you could, like the first megabytes, you could see if it looked like more or less what it should be. And that's also why VLC became popular. But it's so popular because VLC plays anything and runs everywhere. Um, and because it was open source, uh, like in the first six months of it being open source, it was moved to Mac OS by a students from uh, 12th University and to Windows by a guy in England that no one else in the team has ever met. Um, but the thing is now VLC went everywhere, including OS2, the last version still run OS2. The three guys who ran OS2 are very happy, especially since one of them is actually doing the port. <laughs> but um, we run on Android, iOS, WinRT, Xbox, all the uh, Linuxes, Unixes, Solaris, Windows, Mac. We're talking about 1 million downloads per day on our website. Um, 
two of those, two sort of those would be updates, right? It's like fresh installs. Uh, and that's, of course, not counting everything that is a proper OS, which has like a correct uh, repository and who doesn't need to go to our website to download stuff. Um, but for Windows and Mac, that's mostly what they do. Um, that makes around 400, 450 million users, uh, which is quite large. Uh, I think it's probably one of the largest open source uh, software in terms of user uh, for that. VideoLine. Um, so VideoLine is uh, um, a community. Most of the people who've worked on VLC and related software, like X264, VLS, uh, VLMC, and so on, did that on their free time. Uh, I know it's becoming more and more difficult to find people who work on uh, free software on the free time, but VideoLine was, in, for a long time, only that. So um, VLC 3.0. So I'm now going to speak about uh, VLC 3.0 that I've been talking about for three years now. So what did we finally put in VLC 3.0? So um, one of the reasons why uh, VLC 3.0 was so long and is because we, we had done a very good job on the previous release, which was 2.2, Weatherwax, uh, this very dangerous uh, witch. Um, and it was very nice because um, it was quite stable, so people didn't complain. Uh, often we need to do a new release because people complain too much about stuff that we fucked up. Um, but as 2.2 was a very good one, we didn't care too much. Um, so um, 2.2 was out uh, three years ago. Um, one version had 200 million downloads on our website, so that gives you a more or less good uh, idea of uh, the number of downloads. Um, and it's probably one of the best releases of VLC ever since uh, 086, which was 10 years ago. So now we move to 3.0, which is Vetinari, another this word guy, uh, even more angry than the previous one. We're talking about 17,000 commits, plus 3,500 on Android, 2,000 on WinRT, and 2,000 on iOS, which are separate uh, repositories. Um, it's a very strong release, and especially because we spend a lot of time merging all the code that we are done on the different platforms and mostly on the mobile. So it's a very true convergence between the, the mobile and the desktop version of VLC. Um, and one of the biggest things is we put hardware decoding by default everywhere. It seems obvious and easy. It wasn't really necessary in the past. We used mostly software decoding, and people had to activate that. But now that we have uh, laptops that are even thinner and less uh, powerful than before, uh, and because now 4K and high bit rates are everywhere for videos, we need to have hardware decoding. Um, so hardware now is activated by default uh, everywhere, which is a nightmare because so many drivers are broken. But we can actually do 4K decoding or 8K. Uh, I can do 8K on my phone now. Uh, which is quite nice. We support everything related to 360 video and 3D audio, so that's ambisonics and everything object-based. Uh, we can browse uh, network shares, like uh, DLNA, UPnP, and we do that in the same way, which means that we store the secrets on your uh, local keychain instead of storing them plain text on somewhere. Uh, we move to have 10-bits uh, video and 12-bits video uh, as a correctly working, including HDR support. So if you have like a normal VLC with a good cable, the good graphic card, the good uh, orientation of your TV, the good TV, the good plug, then it might work. Um, I'm half joking, but HDR is very difficult to set up for most people. But the good thing is that we've done what should be done for the future for HDR. We rework everything related to HD audio, so you can do uh, audio pass-through of dts -AG, Dolby, and so, so on. And we added a lot of new formats for adaptive streaming, subtitled, and so on. And of course, moving to Wayland, right? So we have done the first steps that it works on Wayland. It's not perfect yet, because we have uh, some issue with the Qt UI, but we're getting there. And also, with, with uh, a guy rewrote our subtitle rendering stack. So, Displaying text seems easy, uh, and it's probably one of the most difficult parts of uh, video decoding. Uh, because if you want to do correct uh, subtitle rendering, you need to have complex text layout, be directional, uh, phone fallback, and so on. And when you have stuff like 
that. This is my Yalagam, where you need to actually um, do font shaping in order to create some glyph that you need then to display. And it's very difficult. Um, so uh, it's actually a guy who is in the middle of the war zone in Aleppo in Syria who did that for us. Um, he started contributing to VLC, saying, well, you know, I got two hours of electricity and internet per day, but I spend my day playing videos because I can't do anything. Can I help? I'm just like, um, sure you can. Do uh, you know to read Arabic? He says, well, of course. So he started fixing Arabic, and then from fixing Arabic, he fixed so many stuff, and, and we got that. Um, another thing in the VLC is that um, the API for libvlc to use on a third-party project has been increased by a lot uh, because now we use libvlc directly on the mobile ports of VLC, which allows us to, to, to add uh, lots of new bindings and, and so on. Uh, lots of memory functions and lots of stuff that you couldn't do in the VLC easily uh, are now in the API, um, which gives VLC and libvlc actually a good multimedia framework that could do now 90% of what GStreamer can do for you guys but in a more faster version. Um, so platform support. So as I said, we're a bit insane. We support Windows XP to 10, uh, Mac OS 10.7 to 13, Android still Android 2.3, iOS still iOS 7, and Linux, well, uh, it's not really us who build it, but we have almost no requirements uh, on the platform. Um, so yeah, and it's quite interesting because we support more platforms than most of the big, uh, big uh, other proprietary and open source software when you compare to LibreOffice, but when you compare also to Chrome, to Office, and so on, there is not many software that are running on that many platforms and still supported. And so we did the release in uh, February, it was pretty cool. Uh, lots of issues, of course, but not that many compared to the number of chains that we've done under the hood. So the question is, what comes after? Alors, so what comes after? After comes VR. Uh, you probably don't care that much about VR, but a lot of people do. And because we've gone past the peak of VR, and uh, okay, so now VR is going down, we can actually do it because we're going to do it correctly on cross-platform without all the fuzziness and the craziness that there is around when there is a new, um, a new software, right? Um, so we've, for example, we are going to support all the headset in HMD headset, Oculus, Vive, uh, and so on. But instead of using their huge SDK, which are 400 megabytes of crap, we basically reverse help with an open source project called OpenHMD. We reverse engineer the USB protocol, and we are discussing directly on the USB protocol to their HMDs. So you don't need like to have like amazing and big uh, um, libraries who are, of course, all insecure, but you can have uh, directly what you need to display on those headsets. Um, we've also uh, done, so for the current version, what we've done is that we um, you can play any 360 video directly on your machine, you can touch, you can use your mouse and your keyboard and so on to navigate, but um, on a, using OpenGL, but if you have your headset, then you will be able to, to do it in the next version. Um, we support 3D audio, as I said, it's third order ambisonics, I don't think there is any other software that can do that. I think even YouTube is only doing first order ambisonic, which means that VLC is what you have usually the quality you have are for professional use case, but we push that to everyone. Um, and we wrote our own engine for that. Um, but that's cool because you would say, well, we don't care about 3D audio. Yes, but because we did that, now you got these binaural effects where you have a 5.1 or 7.1, um, and instead of having like a 7.1 setup at your home, which you don't have because no one has that, with your headphones, we can recreate these 3D effects directly. Um, and that is because of the work we did with three audio that you don't care about, that we managed to improve the normal version of 5.1 and so on. Um, it's also interesting that we are going to arrive with a kind of virtual theater. Um, I don't know if it's going to be part of the main VLC, VLC version, but basically you will, with your headset, you can be like in a movie theater uh, and see the, so we remodel the 3D the theater room and you can see the, the, the seats and so on and you have the video at the, at the top. So what's happening for VLC 4.0? 4.0 is called Auto Shriek, which is this uh, vampire photograph also from this one. 
Um, we're going to change a lot of things. Um, the first thing we're going to change is that we're going to change the video output architecture um, to have a more push model than a pull model. Currently, we basically uh, go to the output and ask, hey, what can you output? And then from what they can output, convert that. But now that like 99.9% .9 have good OpenGL or Op Direct 3D 11 or Vulkan um, setup, you always have shaders. So we are going to push directly from the codec to the, to the end of the stack and modify that um, so that it's lower latency. Um, and basically, you just negotiate with the next um, element in the chain instead of doing it the other way around. We're writing the playlist uh, uh, and the input uh, in order to um, have um, more um, precise uh, timestamps because now VLC is not completely precise. Uh, and we are going to support a new media library, the media library we took from, Windows, uh, from Android and iOS and put that, and we are going to change the UI, which is why I am in host law because I went to see the cute guy uh, to speak about change of UI. So I will be explaining um, the push model for video output is going to um, allow us to have lower latency, more recycling, we can do more stuff for 3D and VR, and we are going to be able to support better HDR. On the input side, um, it's going to be quite difficult because we're changing the core of VLC, but um, this is what we need to be able to do gapless, right? Because VLC is, can be near gapless, but not perfectly gapless. Um, depending on the, the speed of your computer, there is always a, a time. Uh, by doing that, we are going to split the input from the playlist, and in fact, the input will be able to have two inputs, the next one and the current one. So you can open the next one while you're still doing the, the previous one. Um, so this is uh, a big change, but uh, it's already well, well started. So it should work quite fine. Media library. This is the UI for VLC on the uh, tablet Android. Um, and it's a quite different paradigm from what you have. Usually. When you launch VLC, it's because you're on Nautilus or Dolphin or Finder or Explorer, you double click a video file, it just opens. And then, because it opens, you have VLC running in full screen. Um, on Android and iOS, it's the opposite way, right? Because, well, it's very difficult to put files over there. So once you put them, well, it's not, you don't use file explorers usually on those mobile devices. So what you have is that VLC is indexing everything you can find and gives you an interface like that where you can go and select. Uh, this work has been done in the last two years. It's a media library that is done in C++ uh, using SQLite. Um, and we've uh, ported that to, uh, after Android to iOS. And now we're bringing that to, to uh, the main desktop. So on the main desktop, you will have the same stuff where you can index all your videos, a bit like a kind of light media center, right? Uh, very far from what Concody does, um, but um, something in the middle, right? Um, so something cl closer to that. Um, this is a version we have on uh, the Xbox One and on uh, the, what they call the Windows Store. Uh, the Windows Store has lots of issues um, because of that, uh, um, because of uh, licensing uh, reasons that I can talk about more if you care. Uh, but it has some great idea about the UI, so maybe we're going to bring something similar to that. We're finally going to uh, drop platforms, um, so we only care about uh, having more modern uh, platforms. We will require um, OpenGL on Linux, for example. Okay, we have uh, two interesting projects that we're working on. Um, the first one is completely insane, it's called vlc.js. Um, the idea is to compile everything that you compile in v for VLC to JavaScript, which means everything from FFmpeg, libav codec, uh, x264, and everything, you compile that in web, WebAssembly, not really JavaScript, but WebAssembly. So then you can <coughs> make it run directly VLC inside your web browser, inside your web page, without having anything uh, to change. Um, why do we do that? Well. HTML5 video was there like what, eight years ago now? It still sucks. It doesn't work, it's so complex. And um, every time you need something new supported, then people do it in JavaScript. So now we have like stuff like HTLSGS, uh, which is basically taking 
HLS and TS and demuxing that in JavaScript and then remux that to MP4 because the browser can only read fragmented MP4. And depending on the browsers and the version of the browser, it's going to re, uh, remux the file on in JavaScript to different version or depending on your browser, which is completely insane, right? And the reason is that people have put too much on the, on the, inside the web browsers. It, it's ridiculous, it makes no sense, and every time you want a new thing, you need to wait for the new uh, Chrome version to be out to support that. And I, as soon as the, the Chrome or Firefox are going to drop, um, to drop this format, well, you screwed, you need to re-encode all your video. It's fine for your life because you only care about life, but in general, it makes no sense. So the idea is to say, okay, stop it. Give us a way to output video, WebGL, for example. Give us a way to output audio, and give us a way to be fast. And so uh, with uh, WebAssembly and uh, Threads, we are going to be finally fast inside the web browsers. I mean, we are not fast, right? We're not talking about fast. We are talking about not insanely slow. Um, but <laughs> with that and WebGL and Web Audio, then, well, maybe we can have something that works most of the time. And if the guys from the web browser expose us some hardware decoding, even for full HD, it will work out. Um, so, that's, uh, so that's a project. I started talking about that two years ago. People said that, well, JB, you're completely insane. And the more it goes, the more people say, well, you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, so yeah, so we've been working on that. I got a good demo that is crashing currently because of, um, um, because of Spectre and Meltdown, people, uh, the Firefox and Chrome disabled the shared array buffers, so you can't do that currently, but we will be able. And so expect more of that on, at the end of the year, maybe. And the second one is uh, what I call hardening VLC. Um, so VLC security is very hard, uh, because even if VLC is not too big, we are talking about 800,000 lines of code, um, we compile 60, 70, 80 dependencies from Qt to FFmpeg to libpng and so many formats because VLC can play a lot of things. Um, and a lot of that code was written in the early 2000s and no one cared about security at that point and everyone was writing C by hand instead of writing Rust, also because Rust came 15 years after. But the truth is that um, a lot of that code is insecure and we can't trust our own code. And also, like, when you start to see uh, the, the exploits you have now, uh, they are quite insane. Uh, everything related to return-oriented uh, programming is just like, wow. Um, so the idea is to put a sandbox inside VLC, right? Um, what co what uh, you have on Android, on iOS, or on Flatpak or Snap on Linux, is basically you put a big sandbox around VLC and then you put punch some holes so that you can have capabilities. The problem is that this works fine when you're doing a, a, a Twitter app, right? But for VLC, I need access to your slash dev, slash dev because I need to have access to uh, CD-ROM in row mode to be able to play DVDs and CD audios and Blu-rays. I need to have access to your webcam, so that means I, I need access to your slash dev uh, and read there because basically it could be anything. Uh, same for your DVB card or your ISI card, your SDI cards too much. I got access to your um, networking because I can read some uh, uh, HTTP streams. Um, I can open ports because you want to have a remote control to uh, control your VLC. Um, I need to hook up uh, to Dbus as client and a server for the same reasons. Um, I need to have access to your X11, basically, to, output, to have hardware decoding and hardware displaying. And as the security of X11 is so great, I basically root. So if I crash there, you die. Um, in OpenGL, of course, if you use NVIDIA, then basically NVIDIA driver has also all the rights, uh, and so you're basically uh, in kernel mode, so game over again. Uh, on Windows, um, um, we have something called DWM, which is a display windowing manager, where basically the, 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 the video drivers are half in the kernel mode, half in, the, in, um, in user land. So same, if I crash, I'm dying. So, um, the cr this way of doing one sandbox doesn't work. The correct way is to have a privileged separation and to have like one sandbox for one process for audio that has only the rights for audio. 
one process for video that has only process to video, one for input that has only access to your file system, or one for networking, and the part that is doing most of the parsing has absolutely no rights. Well, no one has ever done that. The only people who did that were, of course, the Chrome people, and they started at the beginning with a, a, a sandbox. Um, but now it's the other way around, right? Uh, we need to retrofit a sandbox to a software that is quite complex, and that's uh, quite difficult. Um, also, we want some APIs that are not available, for example, on the Linux kernel yet. So um, we'll see how to do that. But I think it's very important because there is uh, no other way of, uh, of having secure video player in the future. OK, any questions? Sure. Yeah, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned Rust briefly at the beginning, uh, at the end. I, I remember that sometime last year at FSCons here, somebody was mentioning that you've started incrementally rewriting some codecs in Rust. Is um, that correct? Can you talk about that a bit? Sure, let me check that. Um, let me get some internet. Um, so yeah, we wanted to play with uh, Rust because Rust is the correct language uh, for us, right? Uh, it's if you want if you want to have a, a language uh, for media player, well, um, you can't have a, a runtime that has garbage collection, right? So that rules out all the new modern languages, uh, including Go, D, and and so on. Of course, all the Python and so on, they are just gone, right? So you need to have something that doesn't have garbage collection because the garbage collection arrives and, well, sorry, <laughs> I'm going to pause your, your process for this amount of time. Well, too bad, I got 16, 16 milliseconds to output a frame, and in those 16 milliseconds, uploading the texture to the GPU takes five. So, yeah, I don't, if, so I can't have that, right? Um, so the only way to do that uh, correctly is to get something that would be related to C++ and so on, but that doesn't solve really the issue. So let me show. So what we're starting is of course to play with, um, to play with Rust, because Rust has a very horrible um, syntax. Um, yes. So, um, Geoffrey is, uh, Geoffroy is uh, one of the uh, very old VLC guy who has been, whose specialty was to plug weird stuff inside VLC. So he plugged Haskell in the past. I think he plugged some Go in order to, to have fun. But one of the most interesting projects was the FLV. So FLV is a demuxer. So demuxing is uh, the part that takes a byte stream and splits it in different tracks, audio and video and subtitle tracks. Um, and it's one of the places where you're doing the most of the parsing, so that's probably one of the places where you have more security issues. And if you look at all the security issues in VLC, probably half, half of them were in some demuxer. So that's like the good example. And also, the demuxer doesn't have access to audio or video, and it's like almost isolated. So that's what we're starting to, to work with. I don't know if you can see anything. Um, Yeah, so that looks like it. Um, so it's based on a, a work he's been doing, which is a, a parser called NOM um, in Rust, which is secure. And basically, he used that to uh, replug uh, VLC in it. Um, works quite fine. Um, and also, I'm going to show you why. So the story is that VLC is not a block. Yes. Yeah. So what happens in VLC is that you have a core, and the core is very small. The core is maybe 80,000, 100,000 lines of code. So that's very, very light. 
And what happens is that you plug decoders and modules uh, at runtime. So you start and say, well, uh, I need to read this, and you try to open modules. Um, and the API within the core and the module is, of course, C, because there is no other way of doing a stable API uh, than doing C. We have modules in C++, we have modules in Objective-C, we have modules in Lua, but all of them basically have an API that is in C. So, uh, and also that's one of the reasons why VLC became very popular is that if you wanted to add a new feature, you add just a new module. And you never touch the core because the core is too complex. When I started working on VLC, it took me three years to have my first patch in the core, but I could add so many stuff. Um, which is also the reasons why we have too many stuff that makes no sense in VLC and completely useless. But so, changing one module that is FLV to a different module in the FLV, as long as it, as long as it works, uh, that's easy. And so that's what we've done. Um, and if you look, sorry. So as I was explaining, so the format, which is a demuxer, is a part that is where most of the logic is, where you're splitting the video. When you seek, you seek at that place. When you uh, activate an audio or not, you also, and, and so this is where the most difficult part is done uh, currently. So that's why uh, we, using Rust, made some, some sense. Um, it's not been merged, and we don't know yet how we are going to merge it because of the way it handles dependency, it doesn't really fit the rest of our model, so we don't know yet. Okay. Another question? Yes. I have uh, this thing on. Oh, it's a personal question. Uh, I'm wondering how much time you spend coding on VLC and your motivation behind uh, uh, spending all these years on the project. Probably the answer is too much, but maybe that's not the right way of saying that. So, um, my case is a bit different from most of the other cases on VLC. Um, a lot of developers on VLC, it was a student project, as I said, from the university school from 1998 to 2005. So usually it was your uh, fourth year, so ma first year of master project. Um, and you had t time allocated and you started like that. Um, and most of the time you had like, um, you were in the engineering school on the computer science part. Well, I didn't. So when I was in Central Paris, I almost, I, I spent a lot of time on the server side and streaming the television for all the networking people, for everyone at the university, but not too much time on coding VLC. Um, and what happens is that I came to a very boring internship at, at the end of my studies. Um, and for some reasons, I couldn't have access to a lot of internet. So I couldn't slack on whatever I was, would be slacking on 2006, I guess slash dot. Um, and um, I talked to some people at the, 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 at the, at the, who were working on VLC because some of them were my friend. I said, well, can I help? Because I could clone and, and code. So I started working on that, but I had like almost coded no C++ in my life. And they, they were moving from WX widgets to Qt at that time, so that's 2005, 2006. Uh, and, um, well, so I started like that. Um, and then I was at the point where there was almost no one working on VLC anymore. Um, and the main guy who was reworking the UI and the playlist left on the 1st of January 2007, completely left the project. So, and I was the one starting to write on Qt, and so I felt like, oh, I need to step up. Um, so at that time, we were two and a half still on the project. So then I spent a lot of time 
we're building the community, and it was a lot of fun. Um, but also, I very quickly I was doing all the boring tasks, uh, which means that I was uh, also the one working on the Windows port. I was the one you were working on the UI and the one working on the forums, um, and I was learning a lot. Like that's how I basically learn on developing on VLC. So that was really cool, and also. Um, I moved to the US for one year, I came back, and like there was already like a good aura on VLC at that time, and I was rebuilding the community, so and that was very fun. Um, and then I arrived in 2008, and I basically leading VLC de facto, which is at that time already 100, maybe 100 million users, and well, you would never get that when you're 25 anywhere in the world, right? Um, and the good thing is, multimedia is a pain. It's impossible to, compl to understand. There is so much stuff to learn. Uh, but it's also what makes it cool, because you always have to learn new stuff. Um, and that is something I really like, because I'm always like challenged by what I don't know. Um, as I say, like, this is multimedia, right? There is two rules in multimedia. The first one is this one. In multimedia, if there is a stupid way to do something, someone will do it badly and complain until it's standard and supported. And I am not joking, right? We have people who have been pushing interlaced video inside HCVC as extensions in 2017. It's just like, you got to be kidding, right? The second thing is, in multimedia, everyone thinks they understand everything, but actually no one does. Oh, you know, I found these very nice uh, virtual dub thingies on the internet. I can put this codec with this format and plug it together. It will work out. Well, no, it doesn't. But it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> they do their own extension. They do their own shit. Um, but that's fine because they, they control both the, the server side and the client side, right? And what happens is that five years after, the video is somewhere else and I need to, to work on it. Um, so, I mean, I've been giving talks at YouTube and Facebook video, I realize that they have no idea what they're talking about. Um, but that's because it's fun, right? I'm always learning. I, it's like a big puzzle. Uh, there is lots of stuff to, to, to learn, and um, it's been quite nice. And also, like, it gives me a very good resume. At that point, to answer more your question, it was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to be a developer sometimes. I need to show what I've been doing, and oh, look, uh, VLC. And I've been, I love watching movies, and I've been watching movies anything. I watch absolutely anything. I'm a very bon public. I can watch the worst movie ever and be still happy about it. So. <laughs> Another question? Sure. Is, uh, is it possible to make a living out of the work you're doing for VLC, or is, is, is this a ho hobby project for you, or do you work somewhere else? So, so I got now my own company. Um, so the problem, so the problem we had was so 2006 the community almost dies, and I start rebuilding it, and then I realized that one of the problems is that the university cannot cope with the software. So I created the VideoLand nonprofit in 2008. That goes fine until the iPhone. And the iPhone gets, gets out and everything starts, well, it's very slow and crappy, but at some point people start to have video there. And then I realized that if we want to have VLC on Android and iOS and all those smart TVs and smart whatever bullshit you want to put next, um, we need to have a team of professional guys. Um, and the second thing is I realized by looking a lot at Holo, which became OpenHub, that the contribution to most of the open source project in, peaked in 2009 and 2010. And then it started going down for all the OBS projects. Um, and I realized that when I was doing a conference and I went to, um, to basically to, to a student and um, they said, well, why are you doing that? And I'm, and I'm just shocked when the guy asked me that. And I'm just like, but like, in my time, the cool guys were doing open source. Like, the best of the best are the ones doing open source. And it's just like, with your competency, are you, why are you not starting a startup, right? I want to be the Uber for tombstones. 
think about it. There is a market. Or I want to be like uh, the next Flappy Bird because I'm going to make 10 millions out of blah, 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 blah. Um, and the cool th things were to do startups, right? Not open source anymore or free software. So um, I said, okay, we need people because it's more difficult to develop on, on mobiles because like, when I was working during my day, I was thinking of what I was going to code in the night. My setup is good. I could do my make on Linux. My make of VLC is already running. In 30 seconds, I code something. It's out. For Android, like you, you need to have several devices. You need to wait. You have to certificate. It never works. Then you need to test on other phones and so on. It's a lot of uh, work. Um, so I needed to have people full time. So in 2011, I suggested to the Vidolan nonprofit to create a company that would be a subsidiary of the Vidolan nonprofit. Uh, most of the people of the nonprofit said it was a bad idea, so I didn't do that. But in the next year, in fact, I created my own company doing um, services around, uh, um, around uh, VLC and other video software. Uh, and the company is growing. Uh, we are now 20 people employed full time. And we're probably doing 80% of the work of VLC now, basically, because I hired everyone from the community for that. And that's why you're seeing that the development around VLC is getting faster, and we have our sheet together now, and that we are going to be able to have more releases because now we have people who are professional. It's not something I'm very happy about, but I'm not sure there is any other solution, right? Most of the good guys have been eaten by Google and Facebook. Okay. Um, as I was saying, <laughs> I was saying about useless features in VLC. Well, probably this one is the big, best one. So, uh huh. That goes somewhere. Yeah. So that's actually in a, a puzzle actually working um, in VLC. Um, someone coded that in 2009, I believe. Um, and of course, like you see, like it's not a, a, a like square puzzle, right? It's a, actually Bezier curves that are correctly coded. Um, so it's very nice when you're watching a, a French movie with your girlfriend, and it's fucking boring. Um, so you can actually have fun on that. Um, but you would say, the interesting thing is that it was coded in 2009, it didn't change, and still works, because the API is very simple. And the guy who did that still... So I said, yeah, no one cares, right? No one cares about that stuff. Well, you know what? I had a bug report, because... Um, so you can change that here in the, the, the box, right? And the box was only going to 10, right? <laughs> and I got an email of the guy saying, well, you know, there is a problem because it's too easy, 10. <laughs> I need 16. So I think that now I increase it to 16. <laughs> and I was just like, are you kidding me? Are you actually using that? And I said, yeah, 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 I'm using that. <laughs> but the code has been untouched, right? And that is a very important part, is that the reasons how we merge code in the VLC code base is not about, is it useful? But the question is, can I maintain your code? And if the code is good, then it's merged. Uh, because in six months, I'm going to maintain your code. So I need it to be correctly uh, processed. A question regarding the uh, outreach of and uses of VLC. You talked about the standard platforms and phone platforms. But do you have a lot of other usage too? You know, in, in uh, embedded in cars or... Yeah, shopping yes. malls or all the kinds of you know devices. People have tons of devices now. They're kind of Internet of Things are not only buttons, but they are, you know, all kinds of screens. Can you tell us a little bit? Um, so yeah, we see that a lot, but a lot of them do that without telling us. We realize when people are asking features or reporting bugs with weird stack traces, and then, well, that doesn't look good. So you see a lot. Uh, so VLC is almost everywhere in the broadcast world. Um, everything on QA, on movies, and so on, they use VLC everywhere just to check, right? Because the, the, it's now, if the file doesn't work in VLC, the file is broken, right? Not VLC as a bug, right? So it's the normal thing. Um, and also, you saw that in what we call digital signage, so like screens that 
plain loop for your real estate or your malls, a lot of them are basically VLC rewrapped with a nice playlist management that can do whatever you want and restarts when it crashes and so on. Um, we see a lot uh, on uh, vehicles, mostly planes, where it's basically libvlc that is playing your movie. Um, and we're seeing some IV usage, but I I've not seen many uh, good use, use of that. But technically, they could do that now, right? Especially since now we have hardware decoding where you can do a 4K on 8K in, on that, right? That opens um, a lot of possibility. In the past, VLC wasn't known for that. So that, but now, yeah, sure, no problem. And what we see, and the thing I'm doing a lot with the company, is people using VLC in uh, Android on iOS app. So they take the, and the engine is LGPL, so that's completely fine, right? Uh, the VLC is GPL, but uh, the engine is LGPL, so they can do that, and that's completely fine. So yeah. Everywhere, people been running VLC on smartwatches. Because why not? I see. Mailing list for this technical, but lots is done discussion on IRC, and everything there is a patch goes on the mailing list before being approved. Um, we only use free software for anything on the stack. Um, so IRC, uh, mailing list, a forum, wiki, everything is open source. Um, our CI is open source and so on. But yeah, it was always on IRC a commit list that shows all the commits and a development list. It's quite active. It's not impossible to to follow, but yeah, there is still uh, like 10,000 commits per year makes it quite difficult to fork or to use, uh, to, to follow if you're doing that on any free time. But it's not that difficult. And the, the community is quite nice. Um, so that's, uh, but it's old way, right? So we use IRC and not Slack or Discord. Uh, we use mailing list and not whatever people use now for mailing list, I guess Telegram or stuff like that, um, or Discourse. Um, we don't use Twitter at all, and so on. And so on. Bit, well, what you would expect from guys who write C or assembly by hand. But um, yeah, so uh, what happens is that we, we uh, meet twice a year, uh, usually once at uh, Vidal and Dev Days um, in Paris, and once as for them in Brussels. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much.